All right. Hello there, everyone. Hi, it's 6.30. Oh my goodness. All right, let's try this again. Hello there, everyone. So oh, this is my this is my first time being Kristen. It's a little bit different than being Tony. <laughs> so many meetings, is that why? Well, it's just set up a little bit differently. I, I Tony's not left to keep you all in the waiting room. See, I gotta have I have to admit everybody from the waiting room. Right. Yeah. Whereas Tony's doesn't do that. And hi, no, Dan. We just march in. Right, exactly. You just march in and grab a chair. Right. Allison. Hi, Allison. And Deborah Warren. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know Peter Peter told me to not join us. He's on a work trip to Florida. Yeah, I don't think Peter's gonna join us. I'll I'll get that right this time. I'm writing Barbara right now in absent. Good, thank you. <laughs> All right, so. Town Hall is entering the room. That's going to be a tight fit. <laughs> I assume that's Tony. There's a lot of meetings tonight. Whoa. Oh. Hi, Tony. Hello. It is Tony. Did you see Tony? Can I just hey, take questions from you? There he is. On my screen, he's the center square. Yep, he just came there. The center square. Yep. <laughs> like Paul Lind. That's right. How, do the, how does it arrange the squares? Just I don't know. Randomly? Yep, I think so. Huh. He's random. But Dan's right, Paul Lind was always in the center. Oh, well, you're still a host, Bob. <laughs> right. And apparently with Kristen's, the way she's set up, I have to admit everybody from the waiting room. Oh, if you click on participants. Click on participants, yeah. There should be a, like three dots on the right side that you can click. It's like an options icon. Yeah. And it probably has waiting room. Oh, Check. enable wait. If I uncheck, I've disabled the waiting room. You yeah. are awesome. That's good. So that means no one can wait, right? They'll come running in. They just come running in. They just come barging they in the room. Maybe it's not very hospitable. Maybe you don't have like nice people magazine and the coffee table and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, outdated editions of People magazine. Yeah, I was going to say very outdated, in which yeah. Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, big surprise, are still on the cover. Well, 
So I'm Allison and I are both on. Um, okay. but, uh, Wait. I uh, if if I need to flip over to the CPC meeting for any reason, Allison will stay on. Yeah, there's a lot of meetings tonight. Yeah, and then I'll flip back over. Okay. All right. So I we. All right. So it is what time? No, I can't even see the time. 634. 6 How can I oh, wait? This thing has gone into full screen escape. That'll do. 635. And we have a quorum from the Finance Committee. So present from Finance Committee are Bob Vanderslice, Barbara Beatty, Julie Tarmy, Dan McMackin, um, Deborah Warren. And that's all I see. And we are joined by um, Rebecca and Dan, Dan Dolce. Am I pronouncing it right? He nods yes, so okay. Um, and Wayne Wilson. And um, of course, Allison and Tony as well. So, um, Julie, do, do we have minutes to approve? I mean, that takes... I General. I sent out I sent out the March 9th minutes. If anybody yeah. wants to make a motion, if I right. move, I move that we approve them. I will second that. Second. Thank you. All right, Beatty. Aye. McMacken. Aye. Warren. Aye. Sandersize. Aye. Charmy Aye. That's five eyes. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. So tonight uh, there two, well, three, I guess, real, uh, topics. One is short-term rentals. The other is um, kind of the, the town administration side of the budget. So it's um, town administration, pensions, that sort of thing. And um, we really should start to vote some of the things we've already talked about. So when we're done with the previous two, we can do that. Um, I think we should just jump in and do short-term rentals first. And um, what I would propose is um, we give the floor respectively to the citizens petition group, which I assume is Dan and Rebecca, and um, let them speak for 10 minutes or so. Uh, open the floor to any questions from the committee to that group, and then extend the same to the short-term rental committee, which is um, Wayne Wilson. Does that make sense to everyone? Hey, Bob, is, is Joy the newest member on the committee? Joy is the newest member on the committee. Oh, Joy has joined us. Hi, Hi Joy. Joy. Hi. How, how are you? Tony. I'm good, thanks. All right, so um, what what I just said, I'm going to amend it slightly. Um, since Joy has joined us, this is her first time joining us. I, let's do a really fast around the room. So just you know, uh, committee members, if you could just introduce yourself and maybe one or two sentences about um, yourself and, and kind of uh, what your specialty is or or kind of what you bring to this committee you know what i mean so um and i'll i'll just start us out so i'm and i'll even turn on my video for this all right so um i'm bob vanderslice i am the chair of the committee which is more like a herding cats sort of a position than uh than anything really grand um I've been on the committee for quite a while, so I guess what I bring is some very practical business knowledge, especially about um, running things, doing things efficiently. And I, you know, with the time on the committee, I have a reasonable knowledge of how public finance works, although certainly nothing compared to Tony and Allison. Barbara, you're up. Um, hi, I'm Barbara Beatty, and welcome. And it's Joy, right? Joy, yes. Joyce, okay. Welcome. Joy, no, just joy. Oh, just joy. I was correct. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, so I am a former professor. I taught at Wellesley College, spent a lot of my life on the pike. 
<laughs> I've been, yeah, I've been here in the hunt for many years. Um, and I've been on the committee for a while too. I try to remember. Um, and let's see. So the, um, what the special areas that I bring is I was the chair of the education department. So I have a background in education, also in writing lots of reports um, <laughs> and doing writing and research. And um, I'm very appreciative of all of you um, because it's wonderful to serve with a group of, we're so lucky in our small town to be able to have this form of government and to be able to work together. So I really appreciate that. Thank you all. Okay, Julie. Hi, Joy. I'm Julie Hi. Sherman. Uh, I am the executive director of the Nahant Historical Society. So I, I bring a lot of facts to the committee. I also spend some time in bookkeeping in some of my former jobs uh, as office manager in retail and um, in personnel. And I think I bring a level head to the discussion. I'd like to think that I do. Um, and I'm also the secretary of the co committee. So I take all the notes and uh, get arthritis in my hands. Welcome. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Dan, you're up. Thank you, Bob. Welcome, Joy. It's great to have Thanks, you aboard. Uh, I uh, own and run a small engineering firm and have a familiarity level with construction and vehicles and that sort of thing in town. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see who's next. Deborah Warren is next. Hi, Joy. I'm very glad that you've joined us. Um, you'll have a good time, I'm sure, most of the time. Um, I'm relatively new. This is my, probably, this is my second year. I have a background in software engineering and I am currently a writer. Um, what do I bring to this uh, group? Well, I'm kind of a, um, a fiscal tightwad. Um, <laughs> uh, I haven't shown my true colors yet, but I will. Um, Great attribute. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and uh, well, that's about it. And I'm again, glad to see you. Thank you. Okay, and I think that's it. So we are missing who? We're missing Dana, we're missing Peter Barba, and we're Judy. missing Judy, and Judy. And Laura as well. So, oh, but I want to hear about Joy. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, and now, oh, now, now, you know, turnabout is fair play. So now it's Joy's turn. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Joy Bartlett. Um, we have lived here now for, I think this is our seventh year um, since we've lived here in town. Um, I absolutely love living here. Um, I was asked to join the committee um, by Dave um, uh, Conlin, who is very difficult to say no to. <laughs> um, I am an accountant, so uh, I'm pretty good at uh, figuring out numbers and, and how to organize them. And, um, Hopefully that that's an attribute. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so on to short-term rentals. Um, so I guess I, I, I'm gonna give the floor to Dan who just actually had a very awesome introduction to everybody. Um, so you know who you're speaking to now. Um, I, I think at least my focus or what I would like to learn is, and Wayne, kind of, I'm going to pose the same question to you, is what is the difference between the two articles and why is that difference important? If others on the committee, is there anything else in particular you want to address when? You hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. No. Sure. Well, so Dan, the, the, the yeah. floor is yours, sir. Yeah, thank you. I uh, want to thank the uh, committee for um, giving us this time to uh, answer any questions. So, 
yeah, as you alluded to, the um, both proposals, you know, very similar. And uh, I think the short-term rental committee did a great job. And um, one of the main reasons why we kind of did our citizens petition is we weren't sure if the short-term rental committee would be finished um, by the time uh, they needed to to get everything in for the town meeting. And I think our deadline for a citizen citizens petition was a little bit earlier at the end of January. So um, we wanted to get something in writing so as not to maybe have this drag on for another year. And I know probably at times, uh, uh, Bob, you used the phrase herding cats. I'm sure uh, Wayne probably felt like that. He did his uh, a great job trying to bring everything to a consensus on the short-term rental committee. Uh, so. Again, both proposals very similar, you know, uh, registration requirements uh, you know, are the main, um, I think the meat of both proposals. And then pretty much the only difference um, in, um, you know, the, the provision that we as on the citizen petition don't agree with would be on the short term rental committee proposal. There's the uh, requirement for a special permit process for uh, non-owner occupied or adjacent uh, short-term rental properties. And um, it sounds like it, those that special permit process would involve uh, a zoning board of appeals. And we feel with either the existing uh, requirements in the short-term rental committee proposal or in our uh, citizens petition, uh, basically, both documents are one big, you know, um, pretty comprehensive uh, registration requirements. And so to have an additional process for an owner occupied property, which would be the same use as a non owner occupied property, uh, would be redundant and uh, probably drag on any sort of process for property owners and and potentially create more conflict um, between sort of neighbors or property owners than uh, than than what is what would be uh, existing in the first place so I think that's that's only that's the main difference uh, I mean we would be happy to uh, endorse the short-term rental committee proposal uh, if but for that uh, special permit requirement. So if there's any other additional questions, I'd be happy to answer any of that. All right, um, questions from the committee? I do have a question. Um, would you please tell us again, um, wait, and it's right, no, D Dan. Dave, Dan, Dan, Dan. I actually, I looked you up actually. I looked you up um, on, you know, on Google, it's fun. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more why you don't think the permit is important? Because it does seem as if it ensures a lot of safety kinds of things that I'm just curious why, if you have any other reasons why you think the permit isn't important. Well, you, any property, whether it's owner occupied or non owner occupied, any property that wants to operate as a short term rental would have to file annually with the town and pay annual registration fee. And there's all these you know, requirements that you would need to meet in order to get a certification in the first place to, to begin operating. What we don't agree with is that additional step for the non-owner occupied operators to have to do then a special permit process. So whether it's non-owner occupied or owner occupied property, they'd have to abide by all you know, laws and ordinances, requirements, whether it's safety, traffic, parking issues, noise issues. So you know they all have to meet those requirements. So we think those issues would be addressed uh, by uh, the initial certification process uh, in the first place. But how often would you 
need to be re-inspected? Well, yeah, you would have to file uh, to get your annual permit, annual registration, you know, once a year, uh, pay your, your registration fee, and then um, it'll be up to the town whether they actually want to come visit the property. You know, that's that would be up to them, but it's that, that would be an option. That, you know, that all these short-term rentals would be open for inspections and any sort of other inquiries. So your biggest concern, if I understand you, is that it's just more hoops to jump through, more paperwork, and you'd like to streamline the process. Yeah, I think because uh, they're both the same use, you know, whether it's owner occupied or non owner occupied. So it's not like you're trying to introduce, say, like a manufacturing use into a residential area or, you know, you want to do some sort of retail business, you know, in that property, you know, so the use isn't changing. So having the zoning board involved seems like a you know something that is not necessary and it's you're not dealing with you know someone's trying to change measurements on a property you know whether it's oh I want to increase the height of this structure or my fence height or my fence distance or you know uh, uh, different measurements between property lines so you know for the zoning board to try to have to deal with I mean, what sort of issues, you know, would come up? Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't understand that to, to have them involved. You know, they wouldn't be dealing necessarily with something that's defined and easily um, administered. So, uh, and I think that last week at the uh, planning board meeting, um, we had one of the uh, zoning board uh, re representatives there and he did sort of mention along those lines that it would be something that they would definitely have to uh, sort of rethink and come up with new processes and uh, they they would need sort of clear uh, requirements for any of these uh, uh, permit uh, applications for a non-owner occupied uh, property. So yeah, we do think it's extra work, it might be extra cost, it's extra time. And um, we think it's redundant from what would already be required in each of these proposals. Um, I have a question, Dan. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, these properties aren't going to have businesses like manufacturing and things like mm -hmm. that. But isn't it still a business? It's, it's not, you own the home, but it's not your primary residence. And perhaps you've applied for more than one special permit and you have more than one property. So to me, that sounds like a business. You're in the business of buying up properties and then renting them out uh, short term or even long term. To me, that sounds like a business. How is that not a business? Yeah, I think the actual use of the property, you know, the people would be using that that's not being used as a business. You know, thinking of something like somebody wants to hold, you know, a part or some sort of celebration party, or I think there was one property on the hunt that was trying to host weddings. So we, I think in both proposals, we are, are, are not allowing any sort of commercial uses at the property. Um, so, yeah. Those are, you know, operating as a short-term uh, rental uh, property. Yeah. Is, Isn't any exchange of money actually yeah. commerce and commercial use? Just to be clear on what a commercial use is. If right. money exchanges hands, that's commerce. Yeah, I don't agree with that because the, the, the actual use of the property is going to be residential. So what do we do in a residential property? There's people sleeping there. There's people doing leisure time there. There's people, you know, eating there. So the actual guests, people who are going to be at the property, are actually using it as basically a residential use. The but owner, the, yeah, the owner owns a, it perhaps it, as a business, uh, but it's not being used 
uh, by the actual people at the property as you know as a business use. So if, if I go to a motel for three nights and I pay money to eat there and sleep there, that's commerce. That's a business. What makes you know your proposal any different? I, they're not living there. They're temporarily staying there and paying money to do that. Well, there's, I think there's a big difference, you know, at a uh, hotel or motel or that type of uh, facility. You have employees coming in who work there all day. You have employees coming there who are um, actually cooking, making meals. You know, so there's a lot more involved with the hotel. Of course, they're much bigger uh, footprints. Um, you know, they have giant parking lots. So here with short-term rentals, whether it's our proposal or the short-term rental committee's proposal, um, you know, they're very small footprints. Uh, very you know, limited properties as far as, especially with parking, you know, I mean, you have to abide by all that stuff. Uh, you, know, you can't have any commercial events going on there. It's just to come to sleep, uh, eat, uh, have fun with your family and maybe bring your laptop. You got to write up uh, some work while you're on a business trip. So, um, you know, very different in our opinion. And I think the state law agrees with that very different from hotels or motels, those types of uh, so the, facilities. So the people who own the properties, uh, the non-owner occupied or adjacent, and they don't live in town, um, who takes care of the property? Who cleans the property? Don't they have to hire someone to clean the property? Well, I think, yeah, that's one of, I think, sort of the um, misconceptions that uh, the short-term rentals involving this issue is at least in our town, uh, I think most, if not all, of the non-owner occupied, such as myself, we actually live on the haunt. Uh, we have, and many people have, you know, family homes, long ties, multiple generations they've lived here. So, um, I think that fear of somebody, you know, coming out of town, maybe some foreign investment company, sort of trying to purchase up a bunch of our uh, single family residential properties. I think that has not happened. Uh, if it was going to happen, it probably would have already occurred during this uh, short-term rental boom that had occurred during the pandemic for mostly due to people wanting to get away from the urban environment. So that has now subsided. Uh, the short-term rental market has diminished already. And so I don't think um, we're going to, see any uh, situation like that especially in both proposals don't forget we are you know sort of capping the maximum properties that can be operated as mm. you know a short-term rental at like i think four percent which brings it around 60 total properties and you know we're nowhere close to that uh, being registered with the state and then just operating uh, current listings i think are, still, are well below that and of course there's fluctuation during seasons right now it's obviously during winter, early spring, uh, a slow season. But, um, and, you know, like some of our, our, the, the people on our informal group in the citizens petition, we ourselves actually clean the properties. Uh, you know, we go and clean them after each guest. So, um, you know, it's uh, not like there's oftentimes a giant cleaning company coming in or some other employees you know we kind of operate these as small uh, uh, businesses right so well, that's the difference between the owner occupied or adjacent and the non-owner occupied and adjacent if you you know if i own uh, another property in town and i rent it out for short-term rental i'm here i oversee it maybe i'm the one that goes in and cleans mm -hmm. it maybe i have a cleaning company that goes in and does it um, but if you are not here in town, someone needs to be doing that. Mm. I'm not talking about a big conglomerate coming in and buying mm. multiple properties. It can be one, it could be two. That's, yeah. well, to me, that's, that, that's a business. Well, <laughs> and don't forget both proposals also have, I think, a requirement that uh, if you're not living in town and own the property, 
that you do have to have some operator, local operator, sort of on call, you know, available right. on short notice to deal right. with any uh, the nuisance, whether noise issue or traffic or parking problems. So I think both proposals you know, cover those concerns uh, very well. One of the things that you are, um, Dan, that, that I think the petition seems not to distinguish between which um, the other one does is the requirement that um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is um, in the loop. And because um, there's a distinction in my mind between residential and business properties, maybe that is why the ZBA is part of the process in the other plan. Yeah, the ZBA, I think, is involved with the short term rental committee's proposal because they uh, are have have that special permit requirement, that additional step for the non owner occupied. But as far as owner occupied properties, the short term rental committee's proposal, you know, grants that uh, use as a matter of right so that you just do your normal annual registration, make sure you meet all the requirements, pay your fee. And then if, if you're living on the property, you can operate it as a short-term rental, uh, no matter what. But our difference, like I said, the only difference then would be that additional special permit uh, step for the non-owner occupied property. Um, uh, Dana has had his hand up for a while. Dana, it's a tough crowd. You got to. <laughs> All right. I, I didn't want to jump in and interrupt anybody, but Dan Dulcy, thanks for, for coming in to talk to us about it. Appreciate it. And no um, I'm going to ask sort of like a, a high level question. The question is, what do we say to the people of the hot when we take 64 housing units off the market and put them into short term rentals? Uh, in the middle of, you know, a very severe housing cr cr crunch, you know, it's it's hard to find a place to live here. So what do we say? Well, I mean, it, those are, you know, it's private property. It's a, it's a market that, uh, you know, we have expensive properties here. Um, you can't pin maybe affordable housing issue on individual property owners. Uh, you know, that is an issue that, needs to be addressed you know, from a federal level, which sadly has been neglected for 50 years. So I think that's unfair to, uh, especially when the town just voted to get rid of, you know, the, uh, that Coast Guard housing. Um, so um, yeah, I don't think that's really something you should pin on individual property owners. Um, you know, the, the property we use as the short-term rental um, you know, we put a lot of money into re renovate it, rehab it, um, make it look nice. Uh, it was had been run down because an elderly owner had lived there for many decades on the hunt, and um, uh, and then you know sold it uh, after after they. Uh, well, this this peace, committee so. then has to kind of respond to you know the community as a whole, and um, mm. you know we we hear you as a private investor. Renovating homes, we appreciate that. However, it does take housing units off the market. And, you know, we have a housing problem in this town. And um, it's just generally a problem because we're reducing the the, uh, the pool of available housing for people that, that want to live here, have families here. So I'd like to return, though, one more thing, and I'll let everybody else talk. Um, the special permit, okay? Your citizens per petition opposes the special permit, which... Um, I think kind of makes sense from a, a, a town's oversight um, of these units, but um, why, why, why don't you want to use a special permit? And um, they should probably have an expiration date on those permits as well, not a life permit. When I go to the registry of motor vehicles, I don't get a life permit to register my car. Um, I have to go in and renew it and requalify every couple of years. So, why no special permit? Yeah, uh, I had addressed that earlier. So for in both proposals, 
you have to register with the town no matter what, right? You got certain requirements you have to meet and pay your annual registration fee. So you have to be registered. But then I think in the short-term rental committee's proposal, they have an additional special permit process just for the non-owner occupied properties. Um, and we don't agree with that. We think it's gonna be you know, redundant of what is already required to meet that initial uh, registration requirement to get your annual registration to operate in the first place as a short-term rental property. And um, that's, that's our, you know, we don't agree that there should be a separate special permit process for non-owner occupied properties. Um, yeah, okay. so that's, that's the main difference. Thanks, thanks for answering my questions, appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna jump in now and maybe go in a little bit different direction. Um, you you started your remarks by saying the one of the impetuses for your special permit was because of a concern that there would be no article placed on town meeting floor. And now we're in the position where we have two competing articles on town meeting floor. My concern is that it's confusing. Neither will pass. And we'll find ourselves back where nobody wanted to be. So we're kind of in this position of letting the perfect get in the way of the good. So the, the straight out question is, have you spoken directly with the short-term rental committee um, in an attempt to reconcile and be able to present one article to the town meeting? We not since uh, we filed our petition at the end of January, and um, as I said earlier, yeah, we would be happy to endorse the short-term rental you know, committee's proposal, except for that special permit requirement. So, uh, yeah, they're both very similar proposals, and we all have you know the greater interest of the town uh, at at heart here. So. And you know Wayne and the committee, they did a great job trying to parse through all these issues and what should be the requirements, et cetera. And um, you know we disagree with that special permit requirement. So if I mean, yeah, if, if that's our proposal, if, if yeah, if they would delete that from the short-term rental committee proposal, we'd be happy to move then to uh, withdraw the citizens petition from the town meeting. Okay, any, any further questions from the committee? I'm sorry, can I just ask one? Um, Joy. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Joy. Oh, I, Joy, you changed from video to a, a still. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Absolutely. Um, so I understand that the, the major difference between your group's proposal and the other short-term committee proposal is that um, special permit. And, can, I, and I, I know you explained it, but I don't quite understand it. Can, can you explain again why? Um, why you're against a, a special permitting process if you don't live here in town. Yeah, so uh, in both proposals, uh, if, if you don't live in the hunt, uh, you would have to have a local agent to be present to address any you know, issues that might come up, such as you know, the common ones like noise and traffic and trash, things like that. So, um, you know, there's no difference in that respect. And um, we think both proposals, you know, already then require a bunch of uh, requirements for to be certified annually by the town in the first place. And since you're not changing the use of the property between owner occupied and the non owner occupied, you know, they're both operating as a short-term rental, then why do you have this extra special permit process that is going to perhaps be a little bit ambiguous? It might be difficult for the zoning board to 
and make a decision and adjudicate these. Uh, and we think it could just prolong the process. It could create you know, conflict between neighbors. I mean, I envision or imagine you know, situation, okay, well, what, what happens at a special permit meeting typically, you know, you have neighbors or, or to voice any concerns about, you know, let's say something that's kind of you know, being proposed by a property owner as far as, hey, you know, I want to change these measurements or on my property or whatever. And so, you know, the zoning board can, can easily sort of uh, zero in on, on those issues, but what's going to happen maybe at a special permit meeting for a short-term rental, uh, a neighbor's going to say, well, I don't want a short-term rental next to me. I mean, so what would then be, I mean, you'd kind of be sort of predicting or trying to predict these hypothetical complaints. Well, there's going to be noise or traffic. Well, both proposals already have requirements for those things. And if there's violations by a short-term rental property, well, they got to pay penalties. If there's chronically viol violations there, then you know their registration gets yanked and they can no longer operate as a short-term rental. So we think there's already in both proposals uh, enough requirements and enforcement that this additional special permit process is not is, is not necessary. I have another question, if I may. As you're talking, what you're bringing up is that how would citizens, because the zoning board then is an official body, you know, it's a town official body. How would citizens be able to have a place that provides for them to be able to talk about concerns. Because to me, sort of we're here for that reason, but the zoning board in particular is an officially designated place. So I think it might make it easier to get away from the neighbor kind of stuff because you would know that there was an official place to go to discuss concerns. And the zoning board would be put in the position of needing to listen and then of considering more like a court. And that gives a sense of kind of fairness in my mind. So without the permit, I'm worried that we don't have that kind of official appointed body to help with any concerns. See what I'm trying to say? And how have you thought about that or discussed it as a committee? Well, so yeah, I mean, the zoning board, right? They deal kind of with sort of zoning issues, not with necessarily complaints that, oh, there's noise coming from that house. What do you do if there's noise? Well, I mean, you're supposed to right, call our enforcement body, uh, also known as uh, the police, um, and then they, you know, you log the complaint, or if there's trash, you know, there's we have health health uh, inspector, you know, we have building inspectors. If there's uh, if structures are, are not up to code, etc. So we already have infrastructure for these types of of complaints that are going to arise at short-term rental properties, and which of course arise at all sorts of properties, whether I'm a permanent resident or whether it's a long-term rental. So we have existing infrastructure already. I guess in my view, it's just, I think of the zoning board as having that broader perspective on housing and residential areas across the entire town. And then that's different from the specific police and so on and so forth. And so that's to me what I see the permitting as providing is that sort of higher level perspective. And so I'm I'm wondering about that. Yeah, no, I, I again, I think the zoning board mostly deals with specific issues and properties. So 
uh, you know, they're, they're used to dealing with, um, you know, uh, again, measurements, distances, those types of, you know, use issues, uh, you know, you saw oh, someone wants to do uh, build a, I don't know, a store or something. Okay. That's, that would be, you know, their, I think expertise as opposed to having to deal with, oh, there's a noise complaint, you know, from my neighbor. So, yeah, I think, uh, I don't think they want to be in that position. But see, what I'm talking about is this larger level of perspective on housing in the entire town. And that's a, a, a sort of a level of perspective because the zoning board knows about all of the housing in town. And it's that bigger picture that I'm raising as an issue of concern. It's, well, uh, I understand sure. about your specifics. Mm. And, and don't forget, you know, both proposals, uh, we, you know, they cap the amount of properties that can be uh, uh, operating as a short-term rental. So you're not gonna have, you know, oh, 50% of the properties have been turned in the short-term rental. And, you know, that's what these proposals are. This is the town coming together and the big picture hey, we voted to let's form this short-term rental committee to come up with requirements on um, short-term rental properties. And um, they're both very comprehensive in what is going to be required. So I think all these you know, major issues uh, are addressed by both proposals. And again, the only difference is having that extra special permit process when nothing's really changing between the property uh, use, uh, whether it's uh, you know owner occupied or non owner occupied. And I'm sorry to have taken up time because we do need to move along. And so. um, I, I, underst I understand that. Thank you for listening. No, thank you. See, so, Tony and Julie both have your hands up. I think Tony's hands up been up longer. Yep, uh, but I'll I'll defer to Julie. She's the committee member. I'll wait and I'll go after her. Thanks, Tony. I I just had a um a, a comment. Really, you were talking about the the process and um you know where residents go to voice their concerns or comments or even compliments at times, and that's true of any committee in the town, whether it's the zoning board that winds up being in charge of this um, or, you know, CONCOM, if I want to put a fence up in my front yard. Uh, I know that there are specific guidelines that I need to follow regardless, follow, regardless of, of what I, I want to do with my property. So having that process, I have to get a permit if I want to enlarge my porch. Uh, I'm owner occupied. Uh, it's my own home. And I still have to follow those processes. I think it's even more important. I, I consider myself invested in this town and everything about it. I don't have an issue with short-term rental. Basic. Um, my family has used it. Um, when done properly, I, I, I felt that they were safe in the units that they, they used, but I don't know all the units that are in town, and I think that they all need to be registered with the state. They all need to register with the town, and if they are owner-occupied or owner-adjacent, I know that that person is invested in this town and its residents. If it is someone from out of town, I'm not sure. I mean, unless I know that it's, you know, my cousin Harry who's bought the property and he's going to be using it so that his family can always have use of a place in town, that's that they still need to have a special permit. He's not in town. Someone else is looking after that um, property. He might think he's chosen the proper person to look after that property. And maybe that's not the proper person to look after that property. So I don't think it's a massive amount of paperwork that's going to be involved. I don't know for sure, but it's simply a special permit as opposed to a regular permit. 
If I want to do one thing, I file this permit. If I want to do something else, if I want to drive a semi truck, I have to get a different permit than if I want to drive my my HRV. It's just it's it's a matter of course as far as I'm concerned. I don't. Yeah, let me address that. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, uh, don't confuse. And uh, you mentioned it already, I believe. So both property use, you know, whether it's owner occupied or non occupied, we have to register and right. it's, uh, annually. So, so that we don't disagree on. And I think there's sometimes, you know, maybe the, the evidence doesn't back up this concern of somebody who doesn't live there. It doesn't have the town's interest at heart, as I mentioned earlier. I think all of the non-owner occupied properties, we all live in town. Uh, and I think in the hot, the only town. non, I mean, the only chronically problem short-term rental we had was actually an owner occupied unit. So uh, there's very little evidence that someone who doesn't actually live there is going to not have the best interests of the town uh, overall at heart. So uh, I think we got to be, you know, kind of, we can, can't assume any of this, uh, these, these there, ideas. There have, so. there have been other issues of non-owner occupied short-term rental but the neighbor had the phone number to call the owner who did not live in town and express their concern. So there have been issues. Um, well, there's issues with permanent residents. There's issues oh, with long-term yeah. rentals. So I, I, was I, mean, just, you know. I was just disagreeing yeah. with the fact that there'd only been one issue. And I'm saying chronic, we don't want those chronic issue properties. That's what both proposals are really addressing. Hey, you know, we, we want to maintain this town, uh, you know, the safety, the health, uh, all the, you know, the, the low nuisance, you know, we want to maintain that character. So uh, I think both proposals do a real great job of, of mm -hmm. sort of considering all potential issues. Of course, they're not both going to be perfect, but you know, I think they did their best in um, trying to uh, encompass perfect. everything. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, Tony, I guess you're on. Um, I was just, I was uh, texting Dan Scripp to see if he wanted to join the call. Um, he said he was having trouble getting in. Uh, the reason I was asking him to join, you know, he, he participated in a lot of the short-term rental committee uh, meetings. And I think a lot of the questions that you guys are asking are very good questions or some of the comments you've had are very good comments. A lot of them had, you know, came up during the short-term rental committee process. Some of those questions that you're asking actually have a legal answer to them. And um, Dan, you know, I asked him if he would join the meeting because he might be able to answer some of those questions uh, for you from a legal perspective, you know, as town council. Um, you know, for instance, the question about you know, is it a business, you know, how does it, you know, how is, uh, how is that different from, um, I forget the words that you use, but that was there. I remember that one, Wayne, I know you'll, you'll probably speak to that. I remember that one coming up a lot in your meetings and there was a legal definition um, that differentiated those types of uses. So anyways, I was just wanting to let you know, Dan Script is trying to join the call, but when he tries to sign on, it says something with the waiting room, I think. So I don't know, Bob, if you want to double check it or something. Uh, Did I screw up the waiting room? So we're getting on. I'd like to say one more thing. I'm sorry. I think that the, for me, the crux of this is residential versus um, business zoning. And what we're primarily, I think, talking about here is residential property being used for commercial purposes. And that I think is why the ZBA is in the critical path of the uh, the STR plan. I may have that wrong, but that's what it seems like to me. Yeah. So there's there is like a there's a legal answer to that question. Um, 
And I think what Dan Dolce was just saying is the use the use isn't what differentiate what process you go through. It's the it's whether the it's considered the principal address of the property owner. Um, but Dan can answer the legal and you know the legal point as to you know how that's different. Why short term rentals are different from say a hotel or a retail business or some other type of use that's okay. identified on its own. It's it's I know it's hard to wrap your head around because it's a business venture, but it's actually not in the same category as those other types of businesses that you logically want to associate with by legal definition. So that's why I was asking Dan to see if you could join in. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. So I'd, I'd like to make one comment about, you know, the issue of commercial purposes with and residential zoning. I mean, the last time Wayne Wilson was on, he told us about Saugus. Now Saugus is enacted bylaws that don't allow short-term rentals in a residential zone. It has to be a commercial zone. So it, it's up to the people of the town and the annual town meeting to vote. So it's not like a legal interpretation you know, the, the state's going to tell us what to do. We we have the power to uh, to make that decision. And this committee, the FinCom committee, has the power to recommend or not recommend any citizen petition or, or other warrant articles. So it's, it's going to be on us. Thank you. All right. Um... Any more questions for Dan? All right, then I uh, then let's move to um, to Wayne, and let's follow kind of the same procedure. So Wayne, you know, take take a few minutes, ten minutes or so, um, you know, to, to address what the thrust of the questions you've heard so far are, and then we'll put the, put it out to the committee for open questions. Did we lose? You're muted. I don't think I am. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay, sorry. Um, so anyway, we, our committee was tasked with trying to figure out what to do about short-term rentals. Um, our existing zoning bylaw seemed inadequate to handle the task. And the idea was to come up with some either rules, bylaw changes, whatever, whatever it was gonna take to put some order to the, to the whole thing. Um, what our committee listened to that obviously uh, Mr. Dolce's group of people did not have to listen to was the people that would just assume that short-term rentals weren't allowed at all. Um, so we had we had we could had a wide spectrum of, of ways to go with our with our uh, input uh, findings. So we had some people that would just assume they didn't exist at all, which we could cons if we want to adopt correct the bylaws. So we could certainly do that. We could um, do uh, a special permit for everybody, owner occupied or otherwise, which is the case in Linfield right now. We could have owner occupied only through any process, which is the which is the situation in Salem, Boston, Lynn, Revere, and a host of other communities. So there's there are no non-owner occupied units in those cities and at least legally anyway so the idea was to strike a compromise you know what will what will the citizens of the town and not be willing to live with and what will the short-term rental owners and advocates um not throw up a big uh, opposition to and this is what we came up with um so if somebody wants to rent out a few rooms in their home that's an 
excuse me, owner occupied unit. We, I don't think the town should stand in the way of someone doing that. Someone owns a multifamily dwelling and they want to rent the, a unit that they don't live in, and but live in one of the one of the units in the building. It seems perfectly reasonable that you should be able to do that uh, without going jumping through too many hoops. But if somebody wants to rent a house that they don't live in, it's not their principal residence. And, you know, in some instances, it could be someone that's just down the street, but in all too many, in, in a, it's a growing industry of uh, corporate real estate uh, groups that are buying houses and turning them into short term rentals. These are the people, these people don't care about where they are, they only care about making money. If we have the most relaxed rules in the area, then we're going to be a magnet for that type of activity. You can't do it in a lot in in almost every city or town around us. If we're the only place that a short-term rental could be per, a building could be purchased by a, a out-of-town entity and turn into a short-term rental without any special permitting or any special rules, then they're going to come here because it's going to be the only place that they can do that. That's the that was the primary impetus into putting in the special permit use for non-owner occupied. I'm sure that if, if if Dan owns lives in the hut and owns a different another property in the hut, I'm sure he's doing a great job, of what, you know, keeping track of what goes on there. He has a vested interest. Not everybody is that nice a guy. We have several properties in town that we've received numerous complaints about what the activities that are going on in these properties. And we have absolutely no recourse because right now there's no, there's no process. So I think what our committee tried to do was strike a balance between allowing people to have some certain liberties within their own home and, but, but control the, I'm gonna, I wanna say corporate interest only because I don't have another word for it. And I, I think that's where we struck a balance and I, I don't feel that it's, it's, out of, it's out of place. We could have done a lot of things. We, we actually, are being, if anything, I think we're being more lenient than we could have done. Okay, questions from the committee? And Dan has joined us, thank you, sir. I didn't see the amended notice, sorry about that. Be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, can I can I jump in, Wayne? Uh, thanks for your work on the committee. I know this has kind of uh, been a lot of extra work for you and the other members of the committee, and uh, we appreciate that you're trying to strike a balance. Um, so I'd like to return to the special permit, and um, that's part of the uh, short-term rental committee's proposal. And that's um, right. Would the committee be open to a friendly amendment to putting in a, a two-year expiration of those special permits um, so that periodically, you know, they have to be renewed. I would, the, the way our article is written, the special permit will stay with the owner and in, in, in the structure, but it does will not transfer. In other words, you can't get a special permit and then sell the property with that special permit. So the, the special permit does have, um, I'm trying to think, of, it has an ending. If, if you, in other words, it's it doesn't, it's not, you, typically a special permit, like, you know, for a structural issue is obviously it goes on a deed and it, it's, a, right. it's a forever thing. This special permit only would go with, the, with the, own, the operator of the unit and the owner of the building. If any of those things change, that special permit ceases to exist. Okay, so would the would the committee be open to uh, an expiration of two years of the special permit? That certainly, I think that's probably uh, something that the zoning board of appeals would want to address. But I mean, I don't, I don't, wouldn't have a problem. I mean, I think that's that's reasonable. So, and the, like you say, if our community becomes a magnet for people who want to come in and invest in short term rentals, how can that be good for the town? I don't get it. Well, I'm, I'm going to agree with you that, and that's that was the fear. I mean, it, 
if from in our committee's viewpoint is that we don't want to have the the most lenient rules in the in the area and even with these rules we're actually still the most lenient uh, i would agree i mean i i think it, the, it could go a lot further and the uh, the citizen petition is like they want even less even less regulation than what you've done uh, the unfortunate truth is the citizen petition is is just saying well i'm going to do whatever i want yeah Exactly. Catch me if you no, can. No, I dis uh, disagree wholeheartedly with that. Our petition is actually more restrictive, more requirements. The uh, the short term rental committee is is more ambiguous, and you know we're not saying there should be no registration process or anything like that at all. We're saying yes, that's what our whole document is. That uh, as short term rentals would be the one of the most regulated uh, properties in the town, and. You know, if we if the, if it was going to be overrun with short term rentals, it would already happen. And the Airbnb and and DRBO, they've been in existence since 2007. We've hadn't had any requirements for all those years, and it hasn't happened. Uh, it didn't happen during the pandemic boom. So I think it's a lot of false information that was uh, just discussed right there. So um, I think you got to rethink this a little bit more carefully instead of just maybe throwing out these uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, ambiguous uh, things you might read on the internet. Dan, Dan, we were talking to Wayne here. You've had your time. Thank you. No, I didn't really. I think I had to step in there and, and sort of correct some of the, the, the false uh, information. Thank you. What was the false part again? I didn't get that. Yeah, I don't feel like repeating that whole thing again, but, uh, you know, uh, if the town was going to be overrun by short-term rentals, it would already happen. Uh, you know, th these have been around since 2007, this new technology of Airbnb making it easier to, to book uh, rentals. So we haven't seen it. Uh, our proposal is very restrictive. Uh, you know, it's, it's more descriptive than, than the short-term rental committee. So um, I think you got to go back and, and review both proposals again. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for saying that. Appreciate it. I'd like to just say one thing that's not, neither here nor there, but if we continue particularly to have the petition and the other article, we are going to have to do a lot of upfront education of the citizens before they come to town meeting, because just this small group has taken over an hour trying to understand um, and, and argue a bit about the, these terms. Um, so that's just an aside. I agree with that. But... That's where I was going before. With, with two of them out there, we can find ourselves with nothing. I just want to add to that comment and based on the conversation that just happened. If we go to town meeting, that ends with each other, the citizens petition and the committee, we're destined for nothing to pass. I think both the short-term rental committee and the group of citizens that submitted a petition uh, have come towards the middle and they actually are in agreement in a lot of things. There's one item that, you know, they differ on. Um, we have to, I'm trying to mediate this thing. I mean, I'm neutral on this. I have no, I have no, uh, you know, I'm not pushing one article or the other. I'm gonna try to be as neutral party as possible. So I'm just trying to mediate this thing. I think we have to work together. I think. You know the citizen petition and the and the short-term rental committee need to work together. Um, I think both both groups want to see something pass, which is, you know, we we got to we got to we need something to pass. So let's try not to uh, be at ends with each other. And you know, I think you guys have both done a great job of working your way towards the middle. There's just this one last outstanding piece. Um, so I think you know. In my effort, as I usually do, pre town meeting to kind of go through all Warren articles, I try to provide a neutral um, basis of information on all Warren articles and allow residents to uh, make a decision for themselves. That's what I'll attempt to do uh, with these with both these articles. I think there's a um, foundation of of information that can be shared with residents, um, and then really just kind of explaining how the two the two differentiate and let residents um, decide on their own. But I ideally, 
you know, these two groups that they can come together before town meeting and and um, and work on something in that in that way, you know, that would be extremely helpful. So let's let's try to you know try to be as respectful to each other as possible and work together on this. I know there's one item that's you know there's a differentiating opinion, but um, you know I I think both groups have done a really good job of coming to the middle to this point. Yeah, the, the type A in me right now wants to say, okay, let's get out our calendars and schedule a meeting. Um, but I'm not. I'm going to leave it up to uh, the initiative of the committee, the committees, plural, and the town manager to uh, work something out. But uh, any more questions from the committee before we move on here? No? Okay. Excellent. So thank thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Wayne. Um, thank you, other Dan. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. And um, yep. we, we will move on to uh, town administration budget, including benefits. And that's, I'm... Tony, I don't know whether you want to lead or or uh, do you want Allison to lead? I'd like to share. Allison, do you have the or or Bob, do you have the latest budget doc up to share on your screen or I can try and pull it up I, on mine real quick? I do not. So it would it would be a race between you and me, and I think you would win right now. All right. Um, well, I can quickly note that. Uh, can I quickly talk about the adjustment that we made at the last board of selectmen meeting and sent you all? Um, yes, please. So we we um, we got some new numbers. Uh, from the governor's budget and and their draft their draft form still, but we incorporated those numbers into um, into our documents. We also got an updated number from Linwater Sewer for the assessment that we're going to owe to them uh, in the sewer enterprise account. And thankfully, um, fortunately, it was much less than what we were estimating it to be. Uh, so we reduced our assessment number. Um, and actually we'll be allowing, uh, be able to, once again this year, um, level our sewer rates uh, based on that new number. So our enterprise account is actually gonna be level funded um, and our rate will not change going into the new fiscal year if that number gets approved at town meeting. Um, we also decided to use additional funds from the water sewer retained earnings account. Uh, Allison and I looked at um, our capital plan and financial forecast over the next few years to see if this was something um, that we could handle uh, this year. And we determined that it was um, positive uh, impact to use $250,000 from the retained earnings to pay down outstanding uh, debt in water and sewer. So um, that's, you know, that's, Allison, if you wanna explain a little bit more about the benefit of doing that on, you know, related to our debt while I pull up our spreadsheet. Sure, so um, the 250,000 would be, um, to pay down outstanding bans, which are those short-term one-year borrowings. And so by doing that, <laughs> excuse me, um, we don't have to issue long-term bonds for them. And therefore um, we avoid paying principal and interest costs over a longer period. So, um, you know, by paying down these bans, we avoid issuing long-term bonds and therefore save on interest costs. Uh, so it's similar to, I think we made a similar adjustment last year um, around this time, once we got the Linwater and sewer rate. 
Uh, so it's very similar in that you guys were very happy with that decision to take some of those funds and pay down debt um, and also be able to, you know, not have to increase our sewer rate. So we took the same approach. We just wanted to double check, you know, whatever you don't spend in retained earnings in fiscal year 24 will drop to retained earnings, just like free cash does for fiscal year 26. So what we really wanted to look at was, um, you know, what's our capital plan and future outlook for needed of need, needs of those funds in FY26. We also looked at past years of, you know, what's our typical retained earning amount on an annual basis. And we, we figured, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, it was more beneficial than risky to spend the funds this year and pay down that debt. Hey, could I make a comment about that, uh, everybody? Um, it seems like there's a pause in the conversation. I, I really want to um, commend Tony and Allison for taking that step, keeping the retained earnings within the ratepayers enterprise fund and paying down the debt. In effect, bending the curve so that to avoid future rate increases, if that were to arise. But I think that's a great use of the funds. Thanks for doing that. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, we also, you know, we, we even did an analysis on, you know, what if we, um, what if we, you know, uh, use those funds held those funds and reduced the amount that was shifted to the tax rate and looked at, you know, what would be the benefit of doing that versus paying down outstanding um, debt now. And it turns out to the option that we decided was more beneficial because paying down that debt um, in principle, avoiding additional interest rate costs you know, you're going to save more money long term than, you know, trying to reduce the burden of the debt shift in a one single year period. So that's part of our analysis. Yep. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Uh, so, Allison, would it be March 16th? Yes, that was the last version. Uh-huh. Let's see. Tab, uh, what am I going to? 3B, pages 21 to 45. Yep, that would be the detailed version of the budget, the line by line. So, um, could, before we go to 3B, can we go to tab 3A? Yep. Um, but halfway down, town council annual fee. Um, as I understand it, the town has several um, court cases that are ongoing. Can we add to that and break it down by court cases and estimated amounts? See, 70,000 for annual fee for town council. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. So are you, are you, so we went, we went to 75,000 in this budget here. Okay. Um, so we went from just to, um, I can't see the column heads, but last year's budget was 70. Right. Right, of which we spent fifty-five. That's that's twenty-one. Yeah, no. Nope. La the current year budget is seventy-five, and we nope. plan on level funding it for FY twenty-four. Okay. Last year was seventy-five, of which we spent 
No, there's no spend. The well, FY21 think, is spending. Yeah, I'm at the top here. So this 70,000 is FY21 actual expenses. Okay. FY22. 5,000 is FY22 actual. Okay. Expenses. All right. And then last um, year we had a budget of 75 of which we spent 55. This year we have a budget of 75. Right? Is that right? Uh, this says FY22 department total. I think we spent 55,000. Correct. Which was what was appropriated last year. In the current fiscal year that we're in, FY23, we're funded at 75,000. Yeah. Uh, we don't have actual expenses because we're not done with the year. Not a full year, yeah. Right. But we're level funding it. Okay. So back to Dana's question, I just want to make sure I understand it. Are you are you asking for it sounded like you were asking for future, but I can't I can't I could only provide you past like be hard to it'd be hard to provide you what the estimated expenses are gonna be on specific cases in the future fiscal year. Yeah, but I appreciate that. Not understanding your question. All right, so, but I appreciate that. You know, we're not trying to create a whole another book about the the pending cases, but um, just we'd like some transparency. Perhaps some of us, I don't know about. I can't speak for the whole committee, but um, you know, a, a definition of what that seventy five is for, and maybe it goes in appendix, or maybe it's it's another line item here on the town council budget annual fee and then pending cases, estimated costs. Not a lot a lot of money in the grand scheme of our budget, but that's just the 75,000, it's just a black box. We don't know what it is. It probably shouldn't be described as an annual fee either. It's more like professional services. We get yeah, it's an hourly cost. Yeah, we get charged an hourly rate. So, you know, it's everything from, you know, Dan Scripp, uh, you know, his time, uh, you know, advising the town on, there's so many, a, a lot of times, probably most of those funds aren't spent on actual court cases, but more so, you know, council guidance in different proceedings. Um, so it should really be called, it shouldn't be called an annual fee because it's not like we get charged a flat fee every single year. Regardless, you know, it's it's actually an hourly rate charge. Understood. And, you know, it doesn't seem like a, a huge increase to me, but I mean, there is an increase and I, I think uh, I'd like to know what it's for. What are the cases? Yeah. Um, again, I mean, it's not really, it's not like we, when we budget this, it's not like we look at what are the cases in front of the town? It's we're looking at we're looking at past expenses. Um, you know, what do we? How do we utilize general counsel? It's not always. It's not always like if you want to know what open litigation is occurring, I can obviously provide that to you within reason. Um, but that's not really what comes up with this number, I guess, yeah. or how there, this number is made up. Like there, there is no increase between the two years either. Right, it's level funded from yeah. FY23 to FY24. But I will say, I think that the town, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, expenditures on legal counsel is to prevent litigation. And I think we've done a pretty good job of um, avoiding uh, a lot of the, you know, types of litigation that we've experienced in the past. Okay, um, Tony, I, I think I get where you're going on this, that the correlation isn't quite exact, but um, maybe I don't want to waste everybody's time on the committee, but I, I will put in a request to get a, you know, a top 10 list of cases that the town is um, working on right now in court. Yeah, certainly. 
Um, anybody you know, else has anybody want to talk to this at all? Or I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about this. Uh, Coast Guard housing, you know, is obviously one. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, unique to this past year. Um, okay. I don't, you know, other obviously we're in we're in um, the northeastern related litigation, but that's not paid out of um, that's not paid out of out of our general funds. It's paid out of a gift account. Okay. Yep. I don't. I don't believe we have any other. I'll I'll connect with Dan. I'll double check. I don't. I'll have to see what else we've added over the past year, but. You know, really haven't had any. Um, like I said, most of the time it's it's guidance um, to the ZBA, to the planning board, to the you know to the other committees. It's it's kind of guidance and oversight. We also have you know certainly we have legal costs associated with you know developing the warrant and motions and those sort of things. We have legal costs associated with HR proceedings at times. Right. Um, we're in union negotiations this year, so sometimes legal counsel is involved in that. Uh, so there are different things like that. I can definitely have a follow-up conversation with you on, on it, Dana. That sounds I can, good. I can easily break that down. Um, legal does a good job of breaking down each of our invoices by like general categories of what they're for. So I can just pull invoices and I can break that down for you. It's not not a problem. Yeah. Thanks, Allison, and. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I understand, and we can move on. We can take it offline. Okay. We were at three B. We we're at, that's where yeah. we were. Okay. Um, so town administration is pretty much, it's pretty much everything outside of specific department budget. Um, as you can see, it's really, you know, we've been very conservative with our, um, increases in all of our departments. Um, selectmen, you'll see here a $15,700 uh, increase. Pur purchase of services and professional expenses. Um, a lot of that, so under purchase of services, there's some of it under the selectmen, some of it's under town administrator, some of it's under, under DPW. That was something that we talked a lot about, um, you know, utilizing engineering services to help us uh, advance on, you know, uh, projects that we might be going for grant dollars uh, with, um, you know, for construction or for uh, other engineering, I guess, um, beyond engineering, like procurement and um, bid documents and permitting and things of that nature. Uh, so we've, we've kind of ticked up professional services in a, in a couple different spots to try to help us advance that effort so we can a lot of the times when we're dealing with applying for um, applying for grants, you know, if you can bring something that's shovel ready or a little bit more baked to the application process, you're much more competitive. Hey, so Tony, um, uh, in looking at the Slackman's budget there, I see legal expenses for yep. 2022, 115,000 and it looks like it's actually going down. So is it level funded or not? Yeah, so there's two, so there's general counsel and then legal expenses. So there's two different line items that we spend out of towards legal counsel. One's in the selectman budget here, which is for 70,000. And the other one is the, is general counsel, which I believe is gonna be 
You just passed it, town council. It's on the bottom of that page. The the bottom of page 23, which is 75,000. But FY22, if you remember, the Finance Committee um, approved a number of reserve fund transfers for legal costs as well. That's why the spending looks higher. The budget was actually the same. So we spent more than the 70, so we Correct. Did have a budget on that? Correct. Is that? Can that happen this year? I don't think so. Um, right now, we're actually running under on legal costs. So we haven't even, at this point, we haven't even spent the um, general council budget of 75,000 yet at this point in the year. Okay. Um, when, as of in FY22, as of this year, we had. So actual versus projected, it's, we're spending, well, we spent overspent last year on legal. Correct. And we're budgeting for 75,000 this year. Correct. And so it's not quite like it's level funded. It was level budgeted, but not level funded. Correct. All right. Just want a minor point, but just want to throw it out there and let it hang in the air. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, but the trend is going in the right direction where we're actually spending less on general counsel um, in this past year. Um, and I think that, I think a lot of the general counsel expenses in the previous years i have to look back to see what they were what the reason was for that but i can say that as on the hr side we've gotten you know we've done some hr studies we've brought in some professionals we've cleaned up a lot of our procedures we have i believe avoided a lot of you know hr related litigation because of those efforts so we're, I think we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm not being critical. I'm just pointing a fact out. So, sure. Thank you. Um, public health, as you guys probably recall, this is last year's last year's budget. We created this public health account and significantly increased it. Um, we this this account. All of these, um, aside from purchase services, all of these are hourly, uh, essentially hourly rated um, employees. So we have it funded at a higher amount, but it doesn't necessarily we're gonna mean that we're gonna spend all that money. It really comes down to how many hours that, you know, um, our public health department is gonna be utilized. And the reason we put it this, we did it this way is because we've been so unsure about, you know, what's going to happen with COVID and, and, you know, other different variants. And, you know, so as ARPA money goes away, we want to make sure that we're funding, uh, funding this department appropriately. But again, it's really a, uh, think of it as an up to amount appropriation. I wish I had the percentage, the percentages here. Is that on another sheet, Allison? No. No, it's not. I can do them quickly for you though, if you want. No, it's all right. And, um, I mean, you can see, you know, that like town administrator account here, same thing, uh, pretty modest increases, um, a lot of it, is has to do with um, our collective bargaining agreements and contract requirements. Um, but again, purchase of services, you'll see a little bit more here, $5,000. And uh, HR stipend, this is this $4,000 amount. So we went up in. I'm sorry, I'm misreading the 4,000 town administrative budget. Okay. So we hadn't budgeted for that in the current yeah. year. So we completed an HR study uh, that was funded 
Um, in previous years, we, we, we had funded that and uh, we completed it this past year and it came up with a lot of recommendations. Um, and a lot of those recommendations were related to personnel and their uh, attentiveness to HR proceedings. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, that's why this, this money is in here because we're trying to um, really kind of reorganize some of the roles in our uh, town hall to prioritize that HR function. Um, which will help us in the long run, avoiding, you know, missteps. Uh, advising finance committee. Uh, this probably, this doesn't come under public administration, but I will note here that we did reduce the reserve fund by $50,000 this year. Um, we really haven't spent or needed to go into the reserve fund uh, in the past years. So we've reduced that down to $200,000. It's still, um, you know, almost $50,000, uh, $40,000 more than what we spent in 2022. So we'd still think 200,000 is, is enough. Right, and, and we have that, I don't want to call it a reserve fund. We have the um, the energy fund. Yeah, that's right here. This new right here, utility reserve. So this is administered by Allison. Um, essentially, you know, because because utility costs have been um, in flux and very difficult. You know, right now, electricity rates are really high. Um, it timing wise, as we're going through our budget development process, but electricity rates are going to drop significantly come May. Um, at the time of de developing this budget, a lot of our department heads were coming to us saying, you know, we were experiencing, you know, significant increases in our um, utility bills. What should we put in our budget? And as Allison has explained to you all uh, earlier in, in another meeting, you know, what we really wanted to do was keep their budget planning at your standard two to 3% increase in that line item, and then develop a reserve in that Allison can control. And once, if uh, our departments expend all of their appropriation dedicated for utilities, they can uh, those bills can then be paid out of this reserve under under Allison's uh, oversight. Okay. And is 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 this how we're going to vote it? If we're going to vote it as electrical and heating gas, two separate line items. Is it Allison, or would it just be one? What's the summary version? Like, so it'll just be voted uh, as a bottom line, but um, in the accounting system, I'll budget for them separately, but it'll be voted just at the $25,000. And then I'm able to transfer between the two accounts if necessary. I was just like, trying to reduce some of the overhead of having yeah, to move stuff around if, okay. Yeah, so it's not like, so it, this is really just an operating cost. So you're really just voting the $25,000 operating cost. Whereas in the other budgets, you're voting a personnel bottom line an operating bottom line and capital. And if, if we don't use all of this, it's gonna drop to free cash, free cash through the normal free cash mechanism. Correct, yep. Hey, Allison. Um, the free the free cash. Where does that live? So it's technically, if you were to look at a, a balance sheet, it's retained earnings in the okay. general fund. Um, so that's what it is, and we go through the certification process at the end of each year with the DOR because if we have some receivables that are still on the books or. You know, if we have in other accounts, like some of our grant, federal and state grant accounts, if there's some outstanding receivables there, they'll dock you for it. Um, but it's it's really retained earnings. 
It's like okay. the rough equivalent of retained earnings. Correct. When I first joined the finance committee, my mentor pulled me aside and said, just remember, it's neither free nor is it cash. Exactly. <laughs> All right. That's helpful, but I still don't understand. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It's Dana, it's basically it's a it's a calculation of um, revenue that you didn't, you know, more revenue than you estimated and right. less expenditure than you estimated. So that okay. difference, you know, you spent less than you planned on, you brought in more than you expected. That difference is really, and, and the difference is uh, what calculates it. So that's why when we say, if you don't spend it, it drops to free cash. That's half of half of that formula. Yeah, it, it, we have to be careful about using free cash on an ongoing basis to fund the budget because it's not always going to be there. So it's, that's that's what I know exactly. so far. And it, I I so. I refer to it as a Christmas bonus. You know, yeah. so you, you don't want to, um, you really don't want to pay for ongoing annual expenses with it because you don't know. And, that, and that's what, and that's what we've done over the last few years is we're spending it appropriately on one time uh, expenses like paying down debt, capital, capital infrastructure, capital needs, um, stabilization, OPAD, those types of things. Okay. It works for me. Thank you. And here, this historic trivia. When I first joined the committee, we were running a free cash deficit. Apparently, free cash had been miscalculated for a number of years, and the town had to make contributions to bring ourselves back out of that free cash deficit. It, it hard to get your head around. All right, I'm, I just go ahead. Tony Allison. Um, so moving right along, um, the town accountant, the uh, budget really, you're not seeing much of an increase there as well. Um, that's just contractual obligations and personnel costs, um, skip assessor, treasure collector, um, same thing. We do have um, again, this is a lot of this is the union contract negotiations and other costs associated with contractual obligations and personnel. Um, the town hall, you'll see a significant decrease. That's because we had the additional we had a, a additional funds last year um, in free cash since we were spending ARPA. On a lot of on a lot of things, so that we've reduced that back down uh, to account for you know our typical free cash amounts and what we can spend on capital. But you know you will see that compared to 2022, I forget what the act what the voted budget was in 2022, but historically, you know town hall capital was less than like five thousand dollars. It is that I've now I've brought it up a little bit each year. Obviously, in 2023, the significant increase, but trying to keep you know fifteen thousand um, dollars, you know, honestly isn't isn't enough I, in my opinion. Um, but it gets us. Uh, it helps us, um, you know, invest in some of the needs of the town hall without really stringing the other needs across the board. Um, but I hope to increase this line item a little bit each year uh, because you know the town hall is old and has needs a lot of work. Um, Clerk, electrical weekends, that's going to fall under that. I don't think any of these are going to fall under that. Police. I want to, I'm trying to find the personnel. Um, 
benefits. Benefits. It's, yeah. it's more towards the end of this section. Yeah. So keep scrolling. Oh, let me talk to this real quick though. Um, under inspectional services, we did we did add ten thousand dollars into this budget for short term rental inspection wages. So should should um, the short term rental uh, bylaw pass and you know those those properties be required to um, apply for annual um, licensing, there will be inspectional costs associated with that, um, especially in the beginning. I don't know. I think I think depending on which one passes. I believe the idea was to have them inspected every other year. Um, now, the fees associated with short-term rentals bring in way more than ten thousand uh, dollars expended. So it's still it's not a uh, it's there's still a net benefit financially. Um, but we did increase this line item here, created this new line item, STR inspection wages. Uh, we don't know. You know what that cost is going to be yet, but we think ten thousand dollars. Talk to Wayne. We talked to Wayne a little bit about you know what would it, what's like the going rate for that type of inspection, and based on how many would be allowed, we came up with this number. Hey Tony, to to follow up on that point, um, you know there are a lot of numbers being thrown around, including in the chat here about a hundred thousand dollars net to the town on short term rentals. Is that a real number or is this uh, an urban legend? Because, you know, if it costs, well, for whatever it's going to cost in the future to administrate these short-term rentals, but what is the net to the town last year, short-term rentals? In FY22, the town made $74,000 in short-term rentals. Okay. It's good to know because somebody in the chat was asking about that. So 74K last year. Was that... Allison, was that a full year? No, that was not a full year. What was it? It was, I think it was just less two months because it was passed in May of that year and then wasn't implemented until September. Okay. All right, so you know, July, July and August, assuming July and August are pretty high usage, I think, you know, I think, a you know, eighty to a hundred thousand dollars is a fair estimate on on the on the hotel tax that we okay. get, um, and then in those proposals, there's a fee structure. So there'd be an annual fee for licensing. So there'll be some more revenue in that in that regard. But then you know the town is going to have to. Um, spend some money on processing applications and inspecting the properties too. So I still think it's a net benefit financially, you know, but uh, there will be some, as you can see here, we've added some costs right. in our special services. I mean, it's, it's significant worth talking about. However, in the, in the context of a $14 million budget, it's, uh, it's just basically uh, a rounding error. The ten thousand or the hundred thousand, the eighty to hundred. Um, I probably disagree with you on that. I think it's I think it's pretty significant. It's probably one of our. It's 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 probably one of our larger or more significant revenue streams now that it's been um, introduced. And you know, one of the things that we've talked about um, in this committee. Uh, and in, in the board of selectmen is, you know, how do we create revenue streams that don't impact Nahant residents? As you know, instead of finding new ways to charge Nahant residents, how do we get revenue from people who don't live here but enjoy, you know, our public properties and our town and our businesses and things like that? So, you know, it, it's. It's a pretty significant in that perspective, you know, where it's not coming from the wallets of Nahat residents. You know, I, I, I think it's a pretty valuable revenue source. Yeah, I'd agree. But there is an indirect effect on the uh, the housing issue. In strictly strictly finance, 
it's a strictly financial opinion. Uh, right. You know, I understand there's right. there is a there's there's a whole nother level of you know how does it impact the characteristic of the town? I get that, but right. just strictly financially, I think you know it's it's there's um, right some value to it. You know, and one other thing too, we can move on, but um, nobody's talking about this eighty to one hundred thousand dollars going to zero. You know, it's it's still going to be there. The bylaw is going to affect it, but who knows how, by how much? And it's a variable revenue source as well. You don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just much like the local meal stacks. Much like um, you know, it's all based on how 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 many rent rentals and what they're renting, what their rental rate is, and yeah, it's definitely a it's definitely like a free cash revenue. Christmas bonus. Yep. Um, let's see. Everything else in this inspectional services, you know, as you can see, seven hundred dollars, one hundred sixty-eight dollars. Um, emergency management, you'll see a, a a large decrease because again we had a significant increase in capital spending compared to last year. Um, but we did go up in purchase services. Uh, this is, we hired a company to do, um, well, actually emergency management. Did, did Chief Furlong talk about emergency management when, when he addressed you guys? Yes, he did. All right, so I can skip over this? I think um, so. All right. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to go through, you know, unless I see like a significant increase somewhere or you guys ask a question, I'm just going to keep rolling through, um, you know, $260 level funded in parking for Harbor Master, $1,000, Warfinger, a decrease because of the capital and from last year. I'm going to skip school. Let's skip public works. Council on aging is cultural, library is cultural. All of this is cultural. Employee benefits. Um, this number here is one to definitely, uh, you know, identify as, and it, you know, a um, a burden on our budget development this year. Uh, we've been notified through um, our health insurance that rates have gone up somewhere to six something percent, um, which is a significant increase. You know, recent in the past past few years, we haven't. We've only had minimal increases this year. You know, we're in a uh, our health insurance is through Maya. You know, it's it's a regional uh, system. Some towns are experiencing a ten percent increase, so we're not we're somewhere in the middle. Um, but it definitely is a large, a significant increase um, to our cost this year. The health insurance uh, line item there. Uh, retirement fund is that that's the assessment we get from Essex County retirement um, that went up ten thousand dollars as well um, are there any questions about those uh, I guess uh, the only thing I would add is you know we don't when we get notified of these, increases we don't just you know sign off on them we, we do reach reach out to you know my under health insurance and have a follow-up conversation and see if there's any way we can you know get a little bit of a better deal we do work uh you know the assessment as best we can um 
we're not just blindly signing off on it. So we did have those conversations and um, unfortunately it's just the cost of health insurance has gone up across the board this year. I think that's all, what else is on my, Insurance, pretty standard. Yeah, okay. Um, one thing I added to the agenda, what because there was some interest in revisiting it, is um, expenses related to Coast Guard housing and how those, how that is to proceed. Uh, and, and that that's not in that's an, this is a question it, that's not in the omnibus that is actually that would be funded out of what the prior year's article so there's there is costs associated with pursuing the development or the redevelopment of the property uh, that was funded through the previous year's article. And then there's costs associated with continued um, maintenance of the, or, or property management um, while we have tenants still existing. And then there's expenses in legal while we go through the process that we're going through. So which one would you like to talk about first? <laughs> I have a request. How about the um, the uh, the rents? Uh, where are we at on collecting rents from the existing um, uh, residents there that have stayed past their lease? Um, so it kind of gets into the legal um, process and you know our approach to. Um, evicting the current tenants from the property. Uh, we've elected to not charge them rent after um, the date by which they were intended to be um, removed from the property. And there's a, you know, there's some litigation strategy to that. When you, when you collect rent, um, the tenants have a, you know, a counter argument that they have uh, you know, receive tenantship because they paid rent and we accepted it. So it's it's more of a litigation strategy issue. Um, so we're not collecting rents at the moment. So when it comes to re resolving these cases, um, you, you know, we could say, well, we didn't, uh, I guess the strategy is, well, we didn't collect their rent. We tried to find them some housing, but they still haven't left. Um, so you know, we have to proceed at some point. Um, is that is that where we are as a town? Well, I, I should say too that you know part of that decision was to try to help them find, you know, be able to find new housing and save funds on their on their own to use towards first month, last month security deposit at a, at some new you know living arrangement. Um, I, you know, when we started this process, there was, I think, seven or eight um, tenants, and now we're down to four, possibly three. And obviously, we're not receiving any revenue from the properties that are vacant. Tony, as we look at the holdouts holding up our uh, go forward progress, is it possible that we can run uh, the different activities on parallel path so that we start digging up oil tanks, we start surveying and we start bulldozing uh, while waiting on these holdouts who have all kinds of legal recourse under the Commonwealth. Uh, they're, they're already looking to extend the eviction uh, moratorium as we speak. And what I would like to see is, is uh, activity to uh, bulldoze the houses, survey the lots, sell the lots that are saleable, 
and let the holdout sit there and let the legal process run parallel path to yep. the construction process. Because as we sit now, uh, all the properties off the tax rolls and the majority of it is off the rental rolls. Yeah, so we are, we are doing that. Um, the first step in, the first step in that is putting out a procurement of, you know, bid documents to hire a contractor to come in and remove the hazardous material and demo, demolish the uh, existing properties that are vacant. Um, but we are, um, because of the underground storage tanks and, um, you know, what other construction materials may be hazardous in the uh, properties themselves. We've hired a company called Axiom, who actually we're using for our Ward Road pump station project as well. Um, and they've already begun doing their investigation of hazard of existing hazardous material. Uh, once they're complete, the their scope of work, what we've hired them to do is investigate what materials in existence, develop a scope that can be included in those bid documents and then have oversight of the process of you know, removal prior to demolition. Um, so making sure that it's all handled appropriately, reported to the state appropriately, make sure we get all of our certifications in line. Um, and that's, that's what they're working, right now they're in the investigation phase. They believe that they're gonna have their scope to be included in the procurement in the next 30 to 60 days. I, I think it's gonna be closer to 30. And then we'll be able to put that, that procurement out on the street. And the way that we're gonna put that out and the way that our contract with Axiom is, um, is written is that it'd be a two phase approach. Essentially phase one would be the day we agree to a contract with the demolition and hazmat removal team uh, they would get going on the properties that are vacant. And then phase two would be come back when the rest of them become vacant. So I don't know if that's going to be eight and four or if it's going to be nine and three, you know, or 10 and two. It depends on, you know, how many vacant properties there are the day we, you know, select that contractor. But we, that's our goal is we're, we're moving forward. We've, we've already been making progress in that regard. So we, we expect uh, to have biddable documents uh, within 60 days. We'll have the first report in, in 30 to 60. And then the RFQ can go out and be on the street for what, 30 days and be awarded. That's the hope. So conceivably we're 90 days away from hearing bulldozers roam around that place. Well, 90 days from selecting a contractor, hopefully. Yeah. Hey, so one other thing too, Tony, where is the budget for that, the demolition and the prepare for sale of the Coast Guard housing? It's, it, it's not in the omnibus. It's a, it was an article. It was, I think it was $300,000. It was um, a separate article voted on that in that town meeting that authorized that plan. So it lives in a separate account. It's not in this year's budget. Right. So we don't, there's nothing that the town has to pay to do the demolition of the, the Coast Guard housing going forward. We already have it allocated. Correct. Yeah, correct. Oh, the town's okay. paying for it, but yeah, it's, uh, it's separate from the omnibus budget. But basically what's left is the legal services and any surprises that may come out of the demolition where we might have to pay more. Exactly. The biggest, you know, the biggest, the big elephant in the room is as far as financial goes is those underground um, tanks. You know, if there's a significant, hopefully there isn't, but if there is some sort of significant cost to remediation, um, you know, that could impact, um, you know, we may need to get more funds uh, from town meeting in the future. Uh, it could, you know, impact um, how much funds we have to put towards the debt once we start selling these properties. You know, I don't know. It's gonna, we're going to actually no. All the money from the sale of the property has to go towards the debt. 
right? right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so if if remediation costs exceed, you know, if any professional services costs exceed three hundred thousand, we'd have to go back to town meeting, depending on what that amount is. So earlier in this meeting, I just wanted to make a comment to the FinCom. Um, there was an equivalency argument presented about, well, the town's tearing down these Coast Guard housing and why are they all worried about short-term rentals? But um, the Coast Guard housing, the housing is obsolete and we have a debt to pay on it. Short-term rentals, we're talking about 64 units. And how many uses, units of Coast Guard housing are there, Tony? 12. 12. Okay, so 12 units for Coast Guard housing versus 64 units of short potential short-term rentals. So it's it's really, it's not a fair comparison. Just wanted to make that comment, thank you. Um, so the other professional costs associated with this is gonna be, um, you know, there may be some legal costs, there may be some, professional services to help with the actual um, reverse procurement of the property. Uh, that's something that I would prefer not to do in house. Um, so we're likely gonna hire an outside firm to manage that process, you know, the auctioning off of the properties. Um, so I think, Allison, do you recall what our, Axiom contract is? Don't, but I can um, look it up. I think it I think it came down to like less than seven grand a property. Yeah. So seven times twelve. Something like that. While Pulling you're looking up. while you're looking that up, can I go back to Dana's comment? which is the looking at the amount of short-term rentals versus the Coast Guard, Coast Guard housing units. And I've been reading in the paper, and I'm sure you have as well, Tony, that the state is talking much more seriously about the MBTA plan. And the, eternal, the Attorney General has said she is strongly going to enforce that. She's taking it very seriously. And so I'm wondering, you had said that you'd sent in some kind of plan, but the, and you said that you would send it to us so we could see it. Um, would you still do that, please? Sorry, Sorry I well, didn't do that. Yeah, I'd like to see it because it has apparently become a very important issue for the Attorney General. And it's been in the globe three or four times. And um, so I'd like to know what we've told the state. Yeah, the, I mean, the only thing, the only penalty for not complying with the MBTA zoning is that you're ineligible for um, certain housing grants that actually our town doesn't really utilize currently. So, you know, I don't, I've heard that I heard that comment by the AG as well, but I don't know what they would, you know, what the attorney general would be strictly enforcing outside of, you know, preventing municipalities that are not in compliance from getting certain grant dollars. I'm just saying it sounded like she's taking it very seriously, like she's decided this is really going to be one of her issues. And given that. I, I'd like to see what we have given the state. Um, and I'm I know we have a new committee that's gonna be starting to talk next year. So I, I just would like for us to see it as well. Thanks. I mean, whenever a political, you know, whenever an attorney general decides to say, this is gonna be one of my new issues, you know, and she's on record saying it now. It's been covered a couple of times in the Globe. It's just something to really keep in mind, Doc, because she's going to be following it, and she's assigned it to somebody in her office who's going to be watching it. Right. Um, 
so I think, you know, it's important to, I know they're all related to residential housing, right. but they're all very different topics. Yeah, I so know, understand. Affordable housing and MBTA zoning. Right. You know, they're all very different, even though they're all under the same roof, no pun intended. Um, Nicely done. <laughs> uh, we do have a committee, you know, in place. Uh, we use the help of MAPC for technical assistance. Um, our schedule right now is to focus on the housing production plan and kind of complete that process by the fall of this year uh, okay. or late summer of this year, and then transition into the MBTA 3A compliance. Um, issues and hopefully have that stuff prepared for town meeting of 2024 in May of 2024. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. It's a lot of it's a lot of public process, a lot of work. You know what the the 3A the MBTA zoning is a that that's what it is. It's a zoning requirement, right? Not a production requirement. Important to distinguish those. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, so the ZBA has got to be really on top of that. Planning board. Planning board. board. Sorry, planning board. Right. That's right. Okay. But thank you for making that distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I never sent that to you. I, um, I see Michelle's on the call. Michelle, did you say that you? <laughs> Pulled that off of the state's website. Uh, yeah, I act actually, you can't pull it off from the state website. I actually did a FOIA request for it, but um, if you want, I can. Um, Barbara, I think I have your email. I can flip you a copy of it. I mean, I obtained it as a citizen. So, and Tony, I can resend it to you so you have it. You Barbara, it that, Michelle, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Yeah. There's there's not a lot to what that reporting requirement was. Um, yeah, um, it's just a simple form that it just acknowledges what where we are in our timeline and how we're going to get there and what services, like Tony has said, we are using MAPC to help provide technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So there's no special reporting. It's really just an acknowledgement and kind of just giving notice to the state. <clears throat> and so this is something that we're really going to be talking more about next year after town meeting is what you're saying yes okay yes we have a we have a contractual agreement with mapc it's part of our timeline and scope um but as Tom, tony said we want to get the housing production plan finalized first and then we're going to move right into the 3a meta communities it is a zoning it will require some type of zoning bylaw instrument right now what it looks like what it's composed of we don't know yet that's part of my committee to work through and then present it to the planning board where they'll uh, follow the normal process of a public hearing to get more citizens input before making recommendations presenting it back to fincom just before town meeting so it gets into the warrant for next year for next year right. so it'll be part of 2025 thank you yep and thank you very much for the work your committee is doing because this is a big it's a big issue and it's complicated. Thank you. No problem. Okay. All right. Um, anything else from the rest of the committee? Oh, I have it right here. Hold on. I'll just quickly share my screen. I'll send it over to you guys as well. But Barbara, here's the uh, submission. Oh, oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, just send it to us. Okay. So, you know, it, it was basically just a handful of questions. Who's the contact? What's your, you know, we have a committee who's involved? Right. Um, you know, what's your timeline looking like? It, it really was really high, high level information. But yeah, I'll send this, send this over to you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I see that. It's really a 
pretty basic form. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, more discussion on that? If not, we will move on through our agenda for tonight. So we've done review and approved minutes. We've talked about the town administration budget, short-term rental articles. Um, that there is an I line item in our agenda that says vote on previously discussed articles and omnibus line items. Um, my preference is, I <laughs> honestly, I I'd like to just make ourselves a checklist or some kind of a quick Excel spreadsheet so that we can record uh, when different votes were taken and what's, what votes are still outstanding and just be organized about it. And I, I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. So I would propose we um, postpone that until our Thursday meeting. And I also got a note from Julie, was it you? That, yeah. that yeah. Lynn can't make it. Lynn cannot make it. She's had something come up that she, has to um, begrudgingly uh, attend to. So she cannot make it this Thursday. So we should have more time to go through yeah. an Excel sheet if you have time to make that up. That would be great. But we do have to think about when we can fit her in next week. Right. Right. OK, so is that OK with everyone? It works for me. Yeah, yeah that's fine. All right. So we're really going to be able to go through all the articles we've got and vote on all of them on Thursday, the ones that we're ready to, correct? Yes. Is that the, is that the idea? That's the idea. Excellent. And, and I, have the, I have the warrant, and I've already put in some of the template recommendations, so hopefully oh. pass by. Thank you. <laughs> oh, great. Excellent. Bob, and on that Excel sheet, can we show the advocate among us who will speak on it? Yeah, we need to do that. Yes. Well, okay. well yeah. the ones who will have to write the recommendations. Yes. Yes. Wave the one that decides who presents it at town meeting. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's generally the same person, but yes, yep. yes. And uh, I'm what I'm going to what do would be try to follow the liaison assignments as best you could as I can. Okay. Yeah, that that, right. that that would be good. Like Dan and I have got fire and police and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to flip a coin and one of you gets fire and one of you gets police, unless you have a strong preference. Well, either way. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, can I just ask one 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 question? Sure. Um, because this is um pretty new, and I feel like I'm jumping in and I'm trying to catch up and figure things out um, uh, however, under, understood when I said yes I would do this I didn't understand that that meant you had to be at town meeting and my niece is getting married that day so I won't be here for the town meeting unfortunately um I think that uh, niece's wedding is pretty important yeah it is <laughs> I'd be happy to read your your article okay great thank you your recommendations, though. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank well. Luckily, she doesn't have anything assigned to her. There you yeah. go. Well, yeah. you give, her, give her the give her the templates that you gave me my first year. She said, "Oh, these don't have any questions. Nobody talks about these." And I, I got questioned on two out of the three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you which one I got assigned my first year. There were hundreds of people at the meeting. That's all I'll say. Hundreds and hundreds of people. <laughs> and Dave Conlon turned to me and said, so Barbara. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, <laughs> there you go. I, I seem to remember you, you handled it well, though. Thank you. Yeah. So we're not going to do that to you, Joy. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, we're not. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Dang. You're not going to be here. Not going to. Right. We'll have to do double time next year. Yeah, exactly. OK. <laughs> you can do this. You can handle it. Sir. OK. Um, 
Maybe I should share my screen here. Here's my Excel spreadsheet. Joy, what you'll be missing out on is that Tony gives us and Allison gives us like we get lots of free bottles of water <laughs> and stuff like that. So very nice water, a couple of them and, you know, other little goodies that yeah. it's all. I think there's little candies even, too. It, it, it's akin to the gift bag they hand out at the Oscars, actually. You got it. It's, <laughs> yeah. we, get, we get a little swag bag. <laughs> no hats, though. We should get a FinCom hat. Yeah. Bob, are we going to be... Um... The, real, the real gifts are given out after the meeting. Yes. <laughs> are we going to be going through, trying to assign me uh, right now? Or on Thursday? On Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. I, I, I will, I'm going to make a straw man. And it, it's just that. It's a straw man. So if, if we want to move them around, we can move mm -hmm. them around. But... I, I just prefer to do it in an organized, structured fashion rather than. Great. Sort of, oh, absolutely. Yes. I, I just didn't know if if um, Allison and and Tony needed to stay. Um, I don't think so. If they if they want to drop and like participate in home life, that's more than fine. Okay. Um, up, 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 up. All right. So let's see. We're saying, yeah. So we could we could move. Lynn or the CPC until Thursday the 30th. Okay. I'll reach out to her. Yeah. Any reason to move it to Tuesday the 28th and have two meetings that week? We may start to need two two times a week now. Do, do you know her availability by any chance, Julie? Uh, I I don't. I know her availability is is always very tight. So can I give her an option of either of those days? I don't have a problem with two meetings. Um, it's okay. It's all right with me. Rest of the committee. I think that I think Deborah's right, and I think we probably will need two. So yeah, why don't you go ahead and give her the option? And uh, just a, a what if question though, is there anybody else on the CPC committee that could stand in for Lynn and um, no. kind of give us some update on some of the articles we could at least get started? No, she, um, I can ask her for a draft that we could look at. That would be helpful. But um, I think they're, they're still working on them tonight. Maybe it'll be more than a draft after tonight's meeting. But no, Lynn is the one who really, uh, she spearheads it and the rest of the committee supports her being the one to present them. <laughs> oh, great. Look who's on the short-term rental article on your plan. Peter and oh. me. <laughs> Am I lucky or what? <laughs> anyway. Oh yeah, okay. You're right. Um, I'm, 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 I'm what? Um, all right. So that's uh, okay. Final thing: if we're going to have a meeting Tuesday, we would have to know by Thursday because it would have to be posted Friday. That so we're going to have to uh, get with Lynn you know, kind of buy our meeting on Thursday night so we can post it Friday morning. We post a meeting without an agenda just so that we don't, we have it down in the book. Good question. I don't know. That's a good question. And I'll take that one. I'll ask Diane. Rest, you know, having to worry about right. the last okay. minute. Yeah. Because I, I, you can always amend it. Yeah, I mean, you can I, always cancel. I yeah, mean, you can cancel or amend, and I believe you can amend almost up to the last second. I mean, you can put in a straw man, uh, you know, talk about, you could put in a straw man agenda. Right. Yeah. We could just say uh, approve minutes, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> discuss budget and articles, public forum. <laughs> there you are. 
So yeah, I, I bet, all right, maybe I'll just do that. And then when we learn what Lynn's availability is, we can uh, amend it if necessary. All right, then last topic for tonight was cover letter. And what, what I'd like to do is just throw it out to the floor. What are the significant things that we should mention in the cover letter? I'm not, I don't want to wordsmith it. I just want to start talking about, you know, what, what are the things we want out there that we want to mention or we want to tee up as um, future things to keep an eye on that the FinCom will be watching and working on like that? Well, kind of the, you know, the big issue in front of the town politically really is the short-term rentals. Yep. Um, so that, that might be part of it if the committee agrees. Yeah. Yep. That is the, yep, I agree. If there's going to be some uh, coyote um, issues, I I know, but we not even maybe them. not put that in the letter because it. Well, that's the wildlife. That's the no feeding the wildlife. Exactly. I just I don't know. What do other people think about Tony? What do you I'm think about wildlife in the letter or not? I know it's our decision, but- Would you trade positions with me? <laughs> I knew he would say that. I knew he would, that's why I'm saying the no. The answer one. is no, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. Thank you. I knew that's what he'd say. <laughs> chicken. <laughs> they like chickens. Yum. Well, I mean, we can sidestep it. It's, not, it's really not a financial issue, so. No, it's not. I don't know if it's cover letter material anyways. <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing. No, I don't think so. It's just that it might be a little contentious. But that doesn't mean it has to be in the cover letter. Yeah, it could it could be. We could put in the cover letter the um the status of the Coast Guard housing and how the town is proceeding um, with the plan. I mean, people around town will want to know about that. And but uh, Coast Guard housing isn't on the warrant this year, is it? Right. I, I want to touch on something that's not in the warrant. How about teeing up the new housing production committee? So just saying that we have a new committee, that they'll be working. Not on the warrant. No, that's right. Okay. I would stay away from anything that's not on the warrant. Good point. Yep. You just have a very short cover letter. I mean, yeah, you know, that works. <laughs> I mean, they have a short cover oh, letter. A, day, a, a year off. By the way, Julie, I loved the article about the Roosevelt wedding. Oh, she did a nice job. She very did. nice. I would have liked to have seen more in depth descriptions, but she's young. She's learning. Yeah. Well, excuse me. Um, enthusiastic. So, Bob, back to the cover letter. Um, maybe we should uh, mention that we're going to add to the stabilization fund um, and that this, the town is on um, a sound financial footing at this point. Um, I just wanted to add a comment too. I did speak to Allison about the uh, stabilization fund. We have uh, we're like $660,000 around. Um, it's over at uh, one of the regional banks. And um, so the treasurer and the town accountant are gonna look around and try to get a better return on our stabilization funds and also look for a safe place for it so that we don't exceed the FDIC insurance limitations. And um, so a little bit of uh, risk reduction work and thank you, Allison. Do you also wanna mention just briefly, Tony, you were describing that we have a new emergency management initiative that Maybe. we could tee up. Is that in the, are we paying, isn't there something for that that's in the warrant or not? And it's in the budget, right? In the budget. In the budget. Are you, you, you said we we're hiring some oh, planning? Public safety building, that one? No, 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 no. On, on, I don't know if it's, it's, it's a small amount of money in the, in the emergency management budget. 
it's a uh, it's for it's it's coastal mapping, um, basically on an annual basis and on call service after storms. So it's yeah, like a coastal resiliency thing. People might like to hear that that's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. I mean, it's kind of a small part of the budget, but it's a good. It's a good thing to add in there as, yeah. as like one of the priorities of the of the overall um, overall budget and warrant. Yeah, and it's forward looking. I I would just you know it doesn't have to be a big, but just small mention. Well, I, yeah, I think you know I like what Dana brought up there. I think that um, I think the amount of debt, the amount of money we're putting towards debt above and beyond what's required is significant. I think that's a good thing to talk about. You okay. know, um, especially after we just added an additional 250,000. Um, Allison, do you know what that number is now? Oh, did she drop off? No, she's here. I'm here, I'm still no. here. I don't know what I, but I could get the, I could get that for you. Well, it could be close to like, I thought, I thought before we made that new change, I thought we were somewhere in the $200,000 range of above and beyond what's required this year. So we could be somewhere between four and $500,000, you know, towards debt above and beyond. Um, yeah, Tony too, we, we could stress that, um, you know that these to pay down a debt is going to help us um, reduce the chances of uh, these fees and taxes going up in the future because we have some debt coming up at us, you know, and the the, the debt we take care of now is going to help us. Um, so definitely, it's, I don't know how to word that, but uh, so, something about paying down on the debt and adding to the uh, stabilization fund that those are kind of you know top top line items that uh, we could briefly. Uh, bring to the town in that cover letter. Yeah. I agree, Dana. I think those are important, and they're very they're also forward looking. So what what I'm kind of hearing though is, I think that the rest of the letter is after a couple of years of whatever significant issues, COVID, uh, eminent domain, you name it. We're now in a year where there's really only one large controversial issue, which is the short-term housing. And um, we were, we, we're in a position to start to look forward and take proactive action uh, on the following, right? So pay down debt, stabilization fund, post guard housing, et cetera. I like that. And, and and I think we don't need a paragraph on each of those things, but maybe a bulleted list yeah. or yeah. even a series of attachments. Okay. All right. So I, I'll give it some thought. I'll try to put some structure to that. Um, may not be for Thursday night, but certainly for uh, next week. Thank and, you. Um, that covers the agenda except for public forum and I think the only member of the public left is Michelle I have nothing but thank you <laughs> motion to adjourn okay. Second. Second. there you go thank you okay um uh Beatty aye McMacken aye Bartlett aye Warren? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Ian? Aye. Charmy, aye. Did I get everybody? Joy, did you get Joy? Joy. Yep, yeah, she did. And once again, we're unanimous. Excellent. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.